Welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast, and I am your host, Olivia Fierro, a morning show anchor here at Good Morning Arizona, Arizona's family in Phoenix, Arizona, and a book nerd by passion in the afternoons, in the evening, when we should be sleeping, enjoying a lot of books and happy to talk about them with you, uh, sharing our status as uh, bibliophiles on the side. It's a side hustle. It doesn't pay a lot, but, you know, it fulfills our soul. Is Margaret Stewart. She is our super producer and uh, has read, I think, maybe seven times the number of books I've read this year so far. So, um <clears throat> whatever, but we'll be getting <laughs> a breakdown of um, how she's processing all of this information from our upcoming guest and how maybe she's going to create a new life by, I don't know, this Friday. Who knows? The one person who can give us the expert advice that we all need to make us better people, better spouses, better parents is Dr. Kevin Lehman. And Dr. Lehman, I think even you have lost track of how many books you have written so far. The knowledge is so endless. So what, 63 and counting? Yes, that's the best <laughs> I can do, about 63. <laughs> oh, is that all? That's all the advice you had to share with the world? Come on now. Yeah, I got a couple more books in me. I, I, I'm I'm not going to give out the titles because the titles are so darn good. Somebody else would steal them on me. Probably, but <laughs> I've got a few more books in me. I never thought I'd, I never thought I'd write a book. Okay. I never wanted to write a book. Uh, but uh, my whole life has been sort of a one surprise after another. I graduated fourth in the bottom of my class in high school. Uh, couldn't get in college, got in college on probation with a 12 unit load, got thrown out a year later for stealing the conscience fund, which was just a college prank. I still think it was funny. Uh, the Dean of students didn't think it was funny because he threw me out. But the irony was 10 years later, Olivia, I was a Dean of students. Oh. So there's a story there and not enough time to talk about all that. <laughs> you showed him and now you've got the Lehman Academies of Excellence. And, you know, who knows? There'll be somebody who's maybe a, a rabble rouser right now that is going to be running the uh, running the show and then our future learning institutions. Thanks to you. I mean, the cycle of life continues, right? Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, I was mischievous, but I was never, you know, hurtful. I was just sort of a class clown. I had a sister who was perfect and still is a brother who was near perfect i was the youngest child in the family i shrunk myself years ago i figured this out uh i couldn't compete with those two so i became the little goofball who did things that were a little off the chart and what you learned is you were not the only one who kind of uh, developed an identity or a persona in a family dynamic because of where they showed up in the family. And many people who will be listening will originally have known you as that birth order guy. Yeah, I can't shake birth order. In fact, when I go to New York and I do all the network shows in New York, the early morning shows, uh, I have to be careful not to bring up birth order because the host will find it so fascinating that they don't get to the topic of eight secrets to raising successful kids or why kids misbehave and what to do about it. Whatever the title is, they just hear birth order. And my publisher is, you know, mashing their teeth up in Michigan saying, Lehman, we want you to talk about your new book. And we don't get a chance to do it at the time. Well, that's when you know that you really hit on something that, well, you just need to republish it, you know, sell it in hardcover at a higher price and add an extra chapter at the end or something, right? It, just just, just capitalize on it. Exactly. So well, what do you want to talk about today? Well, I want to talk about a lot of things with you because every time we do get the opportunity to speak, which is often, so we're very lucky, luckily, that you are Arizona-based, but we never have enough time. So there's just so many topics to touch on. Number one, you know that I'm raising a little boy. He just turned nine years old. And clearly, we want to be able to absorb eight secrets to raising successful kids. Uh, so let's start there. What do you think the most important takeaway is for a parent? Because, you know, you know what type we are. We're always, you know, questioning ourselves and worrying about everything and maybe overthinking things and then letting things slide that, that should or shouldn't. Well, first of all, I mean, I do have an advantage. Uh, we have talked so many times, uh, Olivia. I, I, I know you're a great lady and a great mommy, but you're like a lot of mommies. You know, um, 
let me show you how a man juggles. Now, do you see this orange, this one <laughs> orange holding in the air? That's how men juggle. Mm -hmm. Women, and you're one of them, they juggle five oranges at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we talk about raising a kid, and, and my newest book is Eight Secrets to Raising Successful Kids. I would tell you two things, basically. Number one, you are the most important parent. Okay, now I'm walking on a ledge here mm -hmm. in your son's life mm -hmm. because the indelible imprint that's left by you on your son is going to impact how he views life how he sees women in his life, whether he learns to respect women or dog women is going to be dependent upon you and your ability to be an authority without being an authoritarian. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would share with you, since you asked for two, I was talking to my publisher the other day. I said, you know, this book could have been 88 secrets to raising successful kids, but I came up with eight. And the one that I think is probably the most profound is this. And this is my advice to you. Be the person you want your kid to be. In other words, you be the person mm -hmm. you need to be. Your kid will take emotional notes, psychological notes on how you live your life. They'll gauge your generosity, your concern for other people. They're going to figure out, is my mommy a giver or a taker? Is she more interested in material things or are they more important things in life? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, having written all those books, I mean, I shake my head sometimes and I say, wow, how much, how much can one guy write about? But I know that the key word for parents today is successful. They want successful kids. And you don't get successful kids by giving them things. Mm -hmm. The old Kenny Rogers song comes to mind. She believed in me. Your little nine-year-old, if he really walks out of your home someday, knowing that Mama Bear had his back, always had his back, he's going to fly right in life. That's what? a guarantee. Well, that makes me feel good because we, you, you know, you just overthink everything and we, we always imagine that we're making some sort of small little wrong choice that's going to be so disastrous. But I, 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 I'm locking on to what you're saying about uh, a mother's role in a son's life in particular because I think sometimes as as the woman and you're looking at, my, I'm fortunate enough to see my husband and son have such a great relationship, but they're just so different. I mean, boys are different and guys are different and they like to play and wrestle and shoot things and throw things and it fart and <laughs> all of this it's stuff. Now, have you spit this week? No, I don't, I don't no, really like not. spitting and I don't. <laughs> All of those things that they get such joy out of, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm like the third wheel over here, but uh, I guess it's okay for me to just do my thing and, and, and model that part, right? That's right. You just be the mom you need to be. You know, it's really funny when you think about it because little boys, there's not a man watching us right now that hasn't enjoyed going potty outside. <laughs> That's just how we men now. And what makes marriage interesting is you take the masculine and the feminine, the feminine, you put them together, it's a pretty good match all the way around. <laughs> so uh, not, not all my books are rocket science, uh, and that's probably because I lack a high school education. But, <laughs> Um, they're simple, and they try to make you laugh your way through some of this stuff. And that's what we all need. We, we all got to look at it with a, a sense of humor. Like, that's why we so love talking to you, and we always try to uh, get some little free therapy out of you every time we see you. I guess, Dr. Lehman, the big question we say, what, what drives parents is we want our kids to be successful, but successful means something different to everyone. So fundamentally, if you could help listeners hone in on – what that expectation should be. I mean, what are we looking at? Are we looking at happiness? Are we looking at accomplishment, independence? Let's take a snip at happiness right off the bat. I'll be speaking in San Antonio, Texas this week. And I guarantee you, Olivia, that someone will come up to me and say essentially, oh, Dr. Lehman, we're so glad you're here because we too want happy, happy, happy children. Let's put an end to that statement right now. I'm quoting myself out of a New York Times bestseller called uh, Have a New Kid by Friday. And here's the quote, an unhappy child is a healthy child. Mm -hmm. 
So there's times your son or daughter has to be unhappy. Why? They deserve to be unhappy. They were miserable little creatures. They stole something. They lied. They hit their sister, their brother. Uh, you name it, kids will do it all. They're, they're dumb as mud some days. But uh, my point is, in today's society, in the U.S. and Canada in particular, we bring up children, Olivia, to feel like they're the center of the universe. That's problem number one. Uh, if you're a person of faith, which I am, where's the room uh, for God in that kid's life as he or she grows up? There's no room if you see yourself as the center of the universe. And so I think it's really important that you teach your kids to be compassionate for other people, to be givers and not takers. And again, I go back to that earlier point from eight secrets to raising successful kids. Hey, parent, be the parent. Don't worry about your kids so much. Be the parent you need to be. Be the parent you want your kid to be. And they'll model it. You don't have to, they'll absorb it. Every day they're taking notes on how you live your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and without without structure and rules and having to say no sometimes or most of the time, <laughs> most of the time it seems. You mentioned rules and uh, firstborn children who devour books night and day tend to have more than their fair share of rules. And I'm quoting a friend of mine who said, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Now, rules work in the military. Rules work in police academies. But without relationship, they blow up in your face. So, parent, it's always about the relationship you have with your son or daughter, which is based upon mutual respect. You hold those little suckers accountable. And you're not, a, you're not afraid to pull a rug out once in a while and let them tumble. It's good for them. So, so why do they misbehave? Oh, kids misbehave for three basic reasons. I'll make this so simple. All kids come out of the womb, and they're attention getters. Even the baby who's just got hunger pangs because they're hungry is going to cry. He's going to get attention. So kids get attention positively or negatively. If they don't get enough positive attention, they move quickly toward negative attention, and then they get more discouraged about how life's working out for them, and before long, you have a powerful little buzzard on your hand. Now, the attention getter says, I only count in life, Olivia, when you pay attention to me, when I get things my way, when I'm the limelight, the center of attention. The power-driven kid says, I only count life when I win, when I dominate, when I control. Now, think about your nine-year-old son for a minute. Mm -hmm. His mantra in life is, I only count life when I dominate, when I control, when I win. I'll let you answer the question, what kind of a husband will he make someday? Mm -hmm. See, I, I've never had a woman say, hey, Lehman, I just love the way my husband, Harold, controls me. <laughs> <laughs> I've always looked for a spouse to control my time and money and uh, yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. So that third reason, uh, the third reason why kids misbehave is out of revenge. They feel hurt by life. Our prisons are full of these people. Uh, I feel hurt by life. Therefore I have a right to strike out other people. And what's nice about what the paradigm I just shared with you from the book, uh, why kids misbehave and what to do about it. If you just look at your own feelings when your kid misbehaves, are you annoyed? He or she's an attention getter. Are you provoked? He's a powerful child. She's a powerful child. And watch out for the shy child because many times, here's a secret, the shy child is a powerful little sucker <laughs> who makes adults tippy-toe around them because they're so special. Mm -hmm. I am dog. You told you told me that, and uh, and that's certainly a, a dynamic that we've been living out. And I and I'll cringe because I'll hear people say, "Oh, well, he he's shy," uh, and, and they'll kind of like lay lay that label out there and, and kind of setting a scene to accommodate. And I don't actually believe that he's shy. I just think that he likes to, you know, what you're saying, have a control of a situation and be be catered to or handheld until he chooses to run and, and have fun and take off. Exactly. So, you know, it's, uh, we teach kids to misbehave. That's what parents need to understand. The behavior is learned behavior. And if you're too authoritarian, and most of us grew up in authoritarian homes, uh, that's going to backfire. Mm -hmm. 
if you're a permissive parent, you know, that's not going to work either. So that midpoint is called being an authority over your children. Parents, you're the captain of the good ship family. You're on the lake of life. We'll call it the KDVK <laughs> lake of life. But my question is, do you have a port of call? Do you know where you're going? Yeah, there's times you got to throw that life raft out for that kid because they get out of sorts. You just don't dump them. But you're an authority. They know who is who. They know mom and dad's role as well as their own. Yeah, and I, what I really try to look at when I'm reading your books is, is, is the reminders of not going in the authoritarian direction because that is, that's, that's the direction that I could more naturally lean. And it, clearly, as you have found many times over, um, that 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 doesn't work. So it's that it's that middle ground. That middle ground. It you make it sound easy, but it's not so easy on the daily. No, it's not easy, but it is simple. There's a difference. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's simple. There's a simple paradigm. For example, and this comes out of the book. Uh, <laughs> here I go again. Um, I think it comes out of uh, Have a New Kid by Friday. Yes. Listen to this profound statement. B doesn't happen till A gets completed. Mm -hmm. Now, how much simpler could life be? Okay, hey mom, can I go here? Mom, can I go there? Could you drive me to the mall? Whatever, kids are hedonistic. They want something all the time. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to do work, it's not done. We look at the room and say, honey, I'd love to take you over there, but I see you still have work to do. You turn your back and walk away. Now they'll come after you. They'll, they'll try to sucker you into, I'll do it when I get back. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll not only clean the garage, I'll paint the garage. Uh, they'll lie to you to get you to do whatever you want to do. So it's simple. It's a, a simple paradigm. Parent B doesn't start till A gets completed. Mm -hmm. It keeps you out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So fighting between parent and child is an act of cooperation. You cooperate, parent. In other words, you're teaching your kid to fight. You're teaching your kid to misbehave. Turn your back and walk away. Say, well, isn't that rude? Well, you can call it rude if you want. I think it's smart. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and, and it, it, it works. That works because that's pretty shocking to them when they're used to getting the attention. Okay, Dr. Well, Lehman. Your husband too, but I won't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Lehman, I do have your book here. I have a new husband by Friday. I am looking at it. And I also have on my desk, they have a new sex life by Friday because your marriage can't wait until Monday. So apparently Friday night and Saturday, those are those are busy days over at the Lehman household. So um, uh, more than five decades. Oh, that's the funny part about this statement. <laughs> <laughs> more than five decades of marriage for you. Um, it's got to be very rewarding to to have any hand in helping others navigate the the waters of long long lasting relationships because it is sad when we hear about so many people splitting up especially we're coming off of this pandemic and sort of an intense time and you know it's like left and right you're hearing about people splitting up and so uh, it seems like you're you're with somebody for a reason we just need the tools to make it work you know, I had one of my highlights in my life. I'm, I'm old. I'm on Social Security and all that. But I was over in Burbank, California this weekend uh, with two of our kids. And we had a Zoom call for Mother's Day where all the kids were talking about their mom, mm -hmm. who I met in the men's restroom, if you recall, when I was a janitor. <laughs> which is a the Tucson Medical Center many moons ago. But anyway, I digress. And it was so much fun to sit there and listen to the five kids share their feelings toward their mom. And one of the things that struck me was that Mrs. Uppington, that's my nickname for my <laughs> Sandy, so many of them commented, Mom, you weren't only interested in me, you were interested in my friends, all my friends, when they hear that you're coming to town, they get excited because they want to see you. Uh, she's one of those people that just makes everybody feel special in life. Um, I wish I had that gift. I, I'm, I'm more concerned about my five kids, to be bluntly honest, than I am all their friends. But my wife, Mrs. Uppington, has this innate <laughs> ability to get into all these other people's lives. But to sit there and listen to the fact that, yeah, we've, you know, we had a baby at 42. There's a curveball. Holy crow. Uh, that was a surprise. And then we had the shocker at 48. 
I mean, that was more than a shocker. That was God. You're you're a cruel God. <laughs> um, but it turned out I I now call her uh, my little blessing from God. I learned a lesson on that one too. So, you know, life sometimes throws you curveballs, but you got to hang in there and you got to deal with what you do and. We've got five kids who want to hang out with their old parents. Mm -hmm. We have a 28-year-old who likes to come over here, bring her boyfriend, and just hang out for us for the weekend. I mean, what's wrong with her, Olivia? I <laughs> Now, that's a book. We, we need her book, I think, right, of, of growing up yeah. in this household and, and uh, learning the lessons taught by um, by dad and, of course, Sandy, Mrs. Uppington. What do you think when, when you when you meet couples and, and they kind of want to know what, what is the secret sauce of, of all of those years? You pick the right person. You pick a wonderful person with all of these great qualities, and, and you get to observe these qualities as they develop and they grow into different roles and stages through your life. Um, but did you have a, a hard and fast rule about the way you argued or the way you spoke to each other or not arguing or, or you know, roles in the house, jobs in the house? Well, let me start with what Steve Covey said. He said, start with the end in mind. Uh, I came out of a very poor family. We didn't have a car when I was a little boy for most of my years of growing up. Uh, we were poor, to put it bluntly. And yet I had a mom and dad who loved me. And I've always said when two people marry, it's at least six. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you to the animal auction and make you a sheep farmer or maybe a pig farmer, Olivia. Okay. And when you're at the auction, you have a chance to buy all kinds of stock. You can buy really high quality stock or you can try to get by with low quality stock. If you go with high quality stock, you're ensure that your herd's going to be healthy and good. What I'm saying is that when there's a lot of dysfunction out there in a family and you marry it, ma'am, you just married all that dysfunction. Okay. And ditto for you husbands. If your wife came out of a rough environment, somebody's going to pay for it. And namely, it's going to be you. Does that mean you can't overcome that? Not at all. You can there are diamonds in the rough out there. But I would say, take a look at in the long term in terms of what are we doing here? And then I would try to teach men that women are inherently weird. <laughs> um, they go potty in groups of eight, 10, 12, four. <laughs> it's a social event. Does anyone want to go potty? I'm, you know, I mean, men don't do that. Uh, they lie. They don't mean to lie, but I'll be just a few minutes. I'm going to suggest to you that's a lie. Uh, it goes on and on. But for men, I would say get behind your wife's eyes and understand how affection is the key to the relationship with this woman. And yes, that means getting up and doing the dishes. In my house, foreplay, if I can use that term on your podcast, foreplay is not only uh, doing the dishes, but wiping off the countertops and check this out, putting away the toaster. I want to ask every man listening right now, watching, what, why would you have to put away a toaster? To me, that is the stupidest, dumbest thing. You're going to use it in 24 hours. Why would you put it away? But Mrs. Uppington, the woman I love, loves it put away. So guess what? It gets put away. So it's those little things. You know, ladies, I would teach ladies that men hate questions. We hate questions. Women love questions. Women love the why word. Mm -hmm. Lehman, if I didn't ask my husband a question, I'd never, he'd never speak to me. Try this. Ask him for his opinion. Ask your son his opinion. He'll talk your ear off. So in the book, the best book, in fact, I brought a copy just to show you. The, the best book I ever did is this book. It's called Sheet Music. Mm -hmm. It's a marriage book. I've got other marriage books that are really good, like The uh, Intimate Connection is a wonderful book. But this sheet music book rocks. Uh, and uh, I get more feedback from that book. Uh, I think more from even that book, from even the birth order book. I've got a, you know, we like you say, we never get a chance to talk. We're mm -hmm. in the studio, you get six minutes and goodbye, Dr. Lehman. This is so much fun to be able to talk to you. But I'll show you another one just for fun. 
This is The Way of the Shepherd. It was published in 2004. It's a leadership book. Look how skinny it is. It's still in hardback. Wow. It's never gone to paper because it sells so bad, so much. So people, if, if you know someone who wants to be a leader or is a natural leader, The Way of the Shepherd is a five-star rated book on Amazon. If you go on there and read the reviews, you'll know why I held that book up for you today. It's, it's one that uh, I think anybody who wants to be uh, a mover and shaker in a positive way in life can read The Way of the Shepherd and really enjoy it. So you, you mentioned the sheet music. I, I have three cousins that are getting, who are getting married over the course of the summer, starting in oh, two weeks. So if we're sending a message to someone who's starting their, what we hope to be a, a till death do us part marriage that's, that's happy and, and good and healthy for them both, what would be the most important sentiment you could say to somebody who's starting off this relationship? Well, I would ask them to strive to always put each other's feelings first. That would be number one. But if I had a gift I was given, I can tell you, my little nephew got married, and I sent him as a, a gift an autographed copy of sheet music, and I said in the inscription, I said, Tom, you're going to get a lot of really nice gifts for you and your bride. But I'm telling you, as an uncle who loves his little nephew, it's the best book you're the best gift you're going to get. Cause it, it, I wish someone would have written that book for me when I was first married, because I had to find out, I mean, I'll tell you a sort of a funny story since we're not on TV early in my marriage, I took a shower, you know, and I decided what my wife would really love was for me to come out of the shower and do a little dance for my bride. <laughs> Now, Olivia, I can only tell you exactly what the woman said. Mm -hmm. She looked at me and she said, Leamy, Leamy, Leamy. That is not a good sight. <laughs> I got to tell you, Olivia, it hurt oh, my feelings. The, the ego, the ego got. was a little bit bruised. But, you know, I learned that, you know, that's who my wife is. She's, uh, I mean, she's the one that showers with a bathrobe on if she had the opportunity. She's a very, uh, uh, what would you say, conservative might be a, a good word. She's just conservative. That's that's who she is. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm Tarzan coming in, swinging on a rope. <laughs> You're trying I to in your life that that's not how she sees the life. You're trying to plan a nudist colony vacation for uh, the the honeymoon or the anniversary, and that's that's a no go. <laughs> you know, I think that that visual I just gave you probably spoiled your whole day. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It made my day. It was amazing. Okay. Well, it, it it goes to show you, even for somebody like you who has made a career out of um, figuring out what what's making each other tick and how we're how we can uh, uh, make our relationships the best they can be, we all misread people, even when our intentions are good. Yes, because you have you'll find uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. You'll have find people who. Uh, aren't the real deal. Uh, until you've lived with someone, you don't really get to understand who they are. And yet, I'll just, let's take living together because so many couples just, I mean, I've signed hundreds of thousands of books in my time. And so many times I'll ask a young couple, well, how long have you been married? Oh, well, we've been together, you know, eight years and, and married six. That's your common um, message you get today from people. And I would just point out in my marriage book, I point out that living together is quite frankly, dating in its heaviest form known to mankind. There's a difference in being married. There's a difference in walking down the aisle. And I remember I pledged my trough and it was years later, I was still asking myself, what the heck is a trough? Anyway, I never did figure that out. 
<laughs> it's everything you've got, I think, right? <laughs> that, that's the only that's the only way to make the full commitment. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta love them completely. I, and you know, I was thinking, I was talking to a guy the other day about flying kids around the country, and I remember the time I flew my daughter Hannah, who's our fourth born, from Buffalo, New York, back to Tucson. And I was talking to the flight attendant, and I asked her if she was doing a turn, meaning, are you going back to Chicago? And she said, yes, I am. I said, well, I'll be on your flight. And she said, wait a minute, you're turning around and coming back with us? I said, yes. I said, I'm just bringing my 11-year-old daughter to Tucson. She's going to be with her big sister until we get back from our time in New York. And she went into this big explanation about how good a job they do with unescorted minors and all that. I said, I know that, but that's not your job, it's mine. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you go that extra mile as a parent and your wife sees that you're willing to do those kind of things, hey, gentlemen, I'm speaking to you. She purrs like a kitten. She's telling herself, I am so blessed and so lucky to be married to a man like that. That is true. And uh, even if he occasionally comes around dancing in an unflattering way. <laughs> yes, yes. That makes up for it, doesn't it? Completely. Completely. Yes, plus it's good to have Come a laugh. It's always good to yeah. have a laugh at somebody else's expense anyways. Well, Dr. Lehman, I just we love speaking to you, and this was such a treat to be able to, to hang out a little bit. So, you know, I may show up at your doorstep in Tucson any day now. You never know. You know, if there was a person, I'm trying to think of people, I better be careful because there's a few people in Phoenix that I would love to hang out with for an afternoon, but you're certainly one of them. Well, I'm happy to be on that list, even if it's a very long one. It's, it's not that long. But... <laughs> with Dr. Lehman, I will uh, hope that off the air at some point, you're going to give us a little a little teaser of what the next title is going to be. But I, I agree with you. We're not going to let anybody steal any of your ideas until they're all in hardback and bestsellers. I work hard on titles. <laughs> you, you, you've done great. So uh, you're giving us hope that we can improve our lives by Friday. And just, just to clarify as we wrap up, do we, for these by Friday books, do we need to start reading them on Sunday at the start of the day? Or when do we have to, to kick in the change? You know, I, I really, I really mean this, especially with a book, uh, have a new kid by Friday and have a new you by Friday. Um, uh, I told the publisher, I said, this book could be have a new, uh, kid by Wednesday, have a new you by Wednesday, have a new husband by Wednesday. Cause if for 48 hours, all of a sudden you become that different person and you start throwing that son, daughter, husband, or wife curveballs, there's going to be a change of behavior. You're going to get that person's attention. There's a belief that therapy takes forever. I mean, that's why I wrote the book, Have a New You by Friday. Uh, wh why not read a book and figure out why you learned to be the way you are and see if you could unlearn it rather than pay $375 a pop to go talk to a shrink. But so it's sort of simple. I, I, once you get a ha hold on some of this stuff, it's pretty easy stuff. You just have to work on being consistent. And if you're consistent and you employ just some of these basic uh, principles that work, you're going to have a new you or a new kid or a new husband by Friday. By the way, have a new wife by Friday. Don't wait for it because it's not coming. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you better not do that one. That's part Sorry, of the secret sauce of happy marriage. <laughs> the Sorry, title, yeah, that title's not happening. Dr. Kevin Lehman, thank you so much. So wonderful to see you and uh, hear you and all the best to you. Let's talk again soon, I hope. I can't wait till we get in the studio again. It'll be fun. Same. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. Bye-bye. Dr. Kevin Lehman, one of my absolute favorite guests and really one of the reasons why I wanted to do a podcast when it was brought mm -hmm. up here is because in TV, you're constantly being told, rap, rap. You're one of those people, rap, rap. Sorry. <laughs> you're out of time. You're out of time. Two minutes, three minutes. I mean, sometimes it's crazy mm -hmm. and you're just getting going and you have so many more questions. So it's so nice to be able to have a more casual conversation. And in truth, I need to read every single word that has been written 
all of them. Oh, wow, um, you've got four of them. <laughs> like four of, four them of right how many did he say? 63. 63. Enough books to have almost accidentally bought his own book and then realized, oh, that's I familiar. That. Oh, I wrote that one. Oops. So what do we want to have new by Friday? Dare I ask? I think, you know, it's funny. I think about this a lot. And the problem that I have the most in my life currently is having energy. Mm -hmm. And I think if anybody has worked an overnight shift knows getting home, even in the middle of the day, people say, oh my gosh, you have so much time to do so many great things with your day. You go to the gym, you can spend the day outside. Yeah, that sounds great, but you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. You are zapped. And it got, it's gotten to the point, especially post pandemic. I mean, it's not post pandemic, but return to work specifically that I don't even have the energy to cook. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am by myself, so I'm cooking for one person, cleaning for one person. I'm just doing all of that. But I've lost all of my energy mm -hmm. to work out and cook and clean and do all of the things that I need to do each day in, mm -hmm. in addition to my work life. So if I could have a completely new energy by Friday, mm -hmm. my life would be so changed. And I'd be, I think I'd be a happier, <laughs> better person in general. Well, working a shift job, I mean, mm -hmm. whether, and plenty of people will, can relate to it. I mean, not just us in the news, yeah. at hospitals, uh, cops, firefighters, all of it. You are just never quite right. No. Like you're at 80% uh, of your probably like brain possibility. You're just nothing. You never look as good. You never feel as good. Not, you just don't do anything as well. So it just, no matter how used to it you get, your body just never really right. adjusts to it because we don't like it. We don't want to be a vampire. No. I used to say, and I still say it, but you, it gets easier, but you never get used to it. Correct. And your body, like even now, I've kind of shifted my schedule coming in from 3.30 to 5 o'clock just in the last couple of weeks. And just that one and a half hour mm -hmm. difference is a big difference in the quality of my sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting any more sleep, mm -hmm. but it's better sleep. So it's just crazy. So I would love to have that sustained energy through my yeah, life. Through the, through the course of the day, through the course mm -hmm. of the week and life. Yes. Um, yeah, and not to take anything away from Dr. Lehman because he's obviously touched on a lot of topics, but coming up uh, as a podcast guest, we will be talking to Dr. Amy Shaw. Yes. And her book is I'm So Effing Tired. And so that is her, her whole focus is on kind of upping the energy and yeah. getting through. <laughs> and also and also I think the big component is probably saying no to things that just yes. drain you and trying to maybe better identify the things that do naturally energize you. Not no just yeah. Is the new yes. <laughs> no is so the new yes. So yes. And I also think that coming out of the pandemic we got lulled into a a, a slower way of life mm -hmm. and an empty calendar. And that empty calendar used to make me sad. And now I'm kind of like, well, I like that empty calendar a little bit. I so I think it's too. a little bit about piecing, piecing some of that with mm -hmm. some of what we've got going on now. Right. Um, because it's, it is, it's more draining to readjust to the expectations of life at the pace that it was after taking so much time to slow down. And biting off so much right. more than we can chew right. or even want to attempt. Yeah. So, okay. So I have a lot of things I would like to have, um, by Friday, I would like to have a new, uh, sense of time. Oh. I am chronically late. <laughs> and What's, what is your, you know, I have windows mm -hmm. for lateness. Like, Oh, I no, say, I'm legit late. Like what box from zero to 10, 10 mm -hmm. to 20, 20 to 30. Well, I don't want to be like that one uh, housewife. Remember the one housewife that uh, was like Teddy? Three hours yeah, then who was always really, really crazy late? That was Dorit. Who was that late? Yeah, she'll she was I don't like want to be a Dorit. She was like two hours late. That's wrong. I would have left like right. well right. before and that. And certainly would have called many times over. Absolutely. Like, oh my gosh, I'm still on my way. Have you Trapped left yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have another cocktail. No, I would never want to be a Dorit, but I am a solid 15 minutes late to 20 minutes late to it's 30 minutes fashionable. late for but it's 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 rude and it's 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 always been my intention to fix it my parents run late we as a family roll late we like to say it's mexican time it's always been a thing but it's always been a thing i've meant to change as an adult mm -hmm. and have been completely incapable of doing so and it and it's not even that i hit the snooze and oversleep i can get up extra early and i'll actually like stand and zone out 
uh, or scroll my phone or something. And all of a sudden, the amount of time that I gave myself extra is gone and then some. Mm -hmm. So it's just a strange thing. So that's something I would like to have better time management skills by Friday. I think it would also make me be kinder at home because I wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, it's time to go. Rushed. Um, yeah. You know, we could be like, hey, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. You know, we got in the car right on time. I mean, that would be a different vibe for me. And I think everybody around me would appreciate that. <laughs> and, and I would also like very much to have a different closet by Friday because oh. I dream of having a gorgeous, like looks like a shop type of closet yeah. like we see on the housewives oh, and all yeah. of our shows, but not even that. Cause that's, you know, that's so extra and that that's, that's budget and construction and all of that. I would like to not be a, disgusting mess of a pig where I am almost spraining my ankle when I'm stepping into my closet to grab my clothing. So that would be something that I know is within my power to <laughs> change and to sustain. And I've done it before, but I just can't sustain it. So I would like to do that and have it be something that sticks. You know, it's funny. Um, yeah, I have plenty of closet space. I have a lot of clean clothing on hangers. Mm -hmm. At the end of my bed. I'm sleeping on my own oh, bed. Oh, really? Wow, I'm really outing myself here. <laughs> With, I mean, and it's just like dozens of clean clothes on hangers that I've just not had. What? The, the energy. energy. To put in my closet. Oh. And I have it all organized. Yeah, like, sure. This sure is a t-shirt. <laughs> this is a dress. Like it all goes into order. The dresses go to the right hand corner oh, of really where do. my feet are. <laughs> mine, mine are done by color and by specific category. So that takes extra energy to go, okay, well this goes into that other closet because I have two side by side closets and one's kind of on the, on the corner. Oh, I have to walk another two feet. Oh my goodness. My bedroom's not that big. Like I should be able to do this. Okay. And the fact that I'm not getting quality sleep because mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. is it all? Right. That's the not, end of my Yeah. But, so I think we could fix some things should, all at once. Maybe we should have ask uh, Dr. Lehman to write that book for yeah. us. It's called an intervention. But yeah, we're yes. gonna give him oh. his next his next idea. Give him a TV show. On he that hasn't one. tapped into this at all. Yes. So we're gonna declutter and we're gonna feel so great and we're gonna be well rested. Our clothes will not be wrinkled. And uh, everything will be clean. So that is the new year and new you, or at least it's our by Friday. Yeah. It could be done by Saturday. Who knows? But anyways. Probably Sunday. Let's go home and work on it. Yeah. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.